so you see this has been there for a long time now when we actually come to the how to convert this into a science because you see we are all conditioned in science we live in science we breathe science how to convert this into a science of consciousness this enormous vedantic literature which is so powerful you know how the vedant condensed into the six systems of philosophy over the next few centuries after the vedic age this thought condensed into six philosophies it's called shat darshan and all of them believe in the fundamental fact that the human being is essentially the atman that is the core truth about our personality consciousness is the truth of life and its manifestation and then the, this shat darshan so many philosophies you will find in india but all of them have this primary understanding that consciousness is quite apart from body mind it enables the body and mind to function and it is the core reality about the human being they all have it so the point is this that consciousness studies has prevailed for a long time it has uh, in different ways the study of consciousness was always there when we come to the modern scientific method let me dwell a bit on that how do we convert this entire thing which was always studied as you know a hoary antique text or a philosophy how do you bring it into the field of science what does the scientific method talk about tell me what does science study we study objects and we study uh, you know you you study objects and you study it yes you study it through a particular method you study it through a method of rational inquiry an investigation into the object so there should be a logic and a rationale and a scientific process behind it then it should the parameters concerning the object should be quantifiable yes that's another important criteria to make it a science and then intersubjective verification should be possible which means if i can do it you can do it too if you satisfy the same conditions and science mainly studies the physical now consciousness is neither an object nor physical but you can still study it you know how this these other three uh, criteria which is uh, which are uh, the first thing is there is a process of rational inquiry into the nature of consciousness this is where phenomenology comes in and especially what is today called existential phenomenology see i am teaching this subject across universities in india at least with five universities we are working on creating syllabus on this because existential phenomenology is doing phenomenal you you have understood what is phenomenology how does something feel to me that is the most important data you can garner about the subject Ab about the subject with the capital s also that's the most important data you can garner now existential phenomenology means to do phenomenology on the nature of my existence not on the nature of my thought not on the nature of my emotion my attitude my personality all that comes much later to be able to do phenomenology on the fundamental nature of my existence is existential phenomenology and what better method is there to do this than vedanta vichar so we converted vedanta vichar into existential phenomenology pointers or what you can say methods the entire methodology i will outline for you how it is done but i want you to see so the rational investigation part of science is satisfied by the science of consciousness second thing is quantifiability also is satisfied do you know today subjective experiences can be quantified i will give you examples happiness <laughs> yes you say how do you quantify happiness mata ji you can quantify happiness there are scales to do it have you heard of the panas scale see i have uh, you just heard i have written two books okay it's all based on research and all this teaching at iits you can uh, order those books i think from the vedanta society of northern california they are all iit courses which have been made into books now this uh, particular scale for happiness called the pana scale it's very interesting it actually means positive and negative effect schedule 
P A N A S. Effect means actually emotion or mood. So the alteration in your moods can be tracked over a period of time and uh, the mean value is set as the you know the the level of happiness you have experienced in that time there are deeper scales also but this is one scale to understand your emotional well-being it's a way of tracking your level of happiness is very common now pana scale like this there is also a scale for awareness believe it or not there is also a scale for awareness uh there was a study conducted in 2009 right here in new york university state university and there a number of um, tibetan buddhist monks who were long meditators uh, they wanted to study the meditative state uh, using fmri scans so they were hooked on to electrodes uh, these monks and they were asked to go into a state of meditation now they being used to long periods of meditation just the introduction of a thought of loving kindness put that monk into a state of a, a trance like state an extremely blissful state where he could rate the clarity of his awareness yes he rated it on a scale from 1 to 9 as he was feeling it so that was the self report the first person perspective and the fmri scans of the meditative state showed very high gamma activity gamma radiation which is a sign of high awareness absence of thought state with distributed phase symmetry it showed very high gamma radiation the fm all the fmri scans so much so that his prefrontal cortex his pfc appeared to be ignited as it were with the meditative state and all the scientists there declared he is the happiest guy on earth <laughs> <laughs> he is experiencing a happiness we know not of the brain scans show it so gamma radiation is proof that the mind is extremely stable and in high awareness and without a thought process how will you explain this and in his self report he actually said that when it came to the meditative state the level of clarity it, it was a felt clarity i can put it at 8 i can put it at 9 now it's on 10 what would you say to this and he really exuded bliss so you see this is this uh, method is actually called neurophenomenology today where you combine the first person and the third person perspectives very important for the science of consciousness you will find an always and very interesting correspondence between the first and third person perspectives that is why today they are inviting meditators people who practice contemplation into this science because a stable mind and the meditative habit is so important to understand neurophenomenology in iit delhi there's a big body called nrcve uh, national resource center for value education in in engineering so there are a lot of these kind of experiments are going on creating scales for awareness scales for clarity emptying thought and understanding what remains what is the nature of that which remains over how do i know i have emptied mind who knows what knows so a lot of research is going on so what i'm trying to say is it is possible to quantify subjective experience so the quantifiability criteria of science is satisfied the third thing is intersubjective verification see vedanta is always you know it's an open philosophy it's for everyone not that uh, it is for some special group of people maybe it was discovered in the mountains but anyone can do it anywhere if you satisfy the conditions they speak of like any lab experiment you have to satisfy the conditions you'll get the same results so if i can do it here anybody should get the same results anywhere that is intersubjective verification and it's a, the tradition of vedant that it is experiential in nature i told you this in my experiment with those kids they didn't know any philosophy but they gave out the exact truth about their experience 
it is experiential in nature you can do it anywhere you can find it out by yourself if you just still your mind you can know vedant by it doesn't require anything else see does anybody doubt the that he exists <laughs> tell me do you ever think i'm not sure if i exist <laughs> it's meaningless the very question so the fundamental nature of our existence has to do something much much more than mere thought it's something far deeper this is what i want you to observe this is the research going on now let me come to the actual method i told you the rational scientific method of investigation existential phenomenology which brings us into the science of consciousness and i'm going to try it on you yes let's do the thought experiments here because if you feel the reality of this you will at once be convinced that it is possible to convert this into a science of consciousness it's no theory or hypothesis it is a, the basic most fundamental fact of our experience and existence so let me uh, go a bit into this uh, what i'm what we call existential phenomenology i'll ask you a few questions you must give me the answers don't try to think oh in which video did i see the answer to this question or uh, what did i learn from which text don't think of all that just tell me what you feel about it that is all i want the first question is do you find your body in your awareness or awareness in your body you find your body in your awareness are you sure i will try to confuse you <laughs> so take care do you find awareness in your body or your body in your awareness no no one answer you have to give me <laughs> you will always find your body in your awareness you know medical science might have told you no 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 the body tissue culture it's very alive it's alive it goes on like a machine but it has no self awareness but that's why you will always find it in your awareness so what does this imply what does this mean if i'm finding my body in my awareness i find my thoughts in my awareness i find objects in my awareness what does this mean awareness is fundamental to everything else See, it's our own experience. We didn't draw from any Upanishad. It's our own experience that anything you will think, perceive, cognize will always be in your awareness. So, awareness is the primary thing about you. Is your primary dimension. It requires no book to tell you this. It's your experience. Only we are not used to thinking like this. isn't it this is the problem see vedanta vichar that is why it should come into the science of consciousness it should become part and parcel of our thinking let me ask you another question you are aware of the body is the body ever ever aware of you no so you become aware of your thoughts also your thoughts any time become aware of you no why they are not self aware the answer is the same so then awareness belongs to <coughs> me who is quite apart from body mind then isn't it obvious see each one of these pointers is so true how is it that i become aware of the body and body does not become aware of me if i have a tummy ache an external instrument has to tell me an ultrasound scan or whatever ct scan has to tell me what is wrong with my stomach i can't find out that that much is the body an object of our perception and experience but this strange tendency to equate with it is there due to adhyas you know the body does not say i but i say i am the body your thoughts don't claim an i but i say my thoughts my ideas my philosophy so your sense of i i want you to see is quite apart functions quite apart of body and mind 
See, this is a tremendous truth about your life. Check and see. You must actually stop the Vedanta which are here and check and see how true this is. What is it that enables me to see my thoughts objectively? What is that I sense? Who sees? Which sees my thoughts? And has it any inkling, any similarity, any complementarity with the nature of my mind? With the nature of my thoughts? No. There is no, absol absolutely no proof that it is in any way uh, complementary to any function of your mind. Any way complementary to any thought. Then what is it? It is of the nature of awareness and has nothing to do with your thought process which, which goes on through your memories and conditioning. So somewhere deep within yourself there is enough evidence that you are the Atman. You are quite separate from your mind and body. But due to the strange fact of superimposition that is why it is Maya, you know, it's unexplainable. I unite immediately with the body and mind. I told you, body does not say I, mind does not say I. I say I am the body and mind. So when you think like this, you will see I am the body idea has no basis in truth. But it's a convenient fiction. We have assumed the reality of our personality based on body and mind. And uh, consciousness is another, like, you know, th theory as it were. So it's, a, it's an assumption, it's a concoction. <laughs> It, it's not the nature of our experience. So in places like this, you must stop the thought process and see the reality of this. That's the most important thing. You know, in an ashram, in a temple, where there is a concentrated vibration. Try this out and see how magically it works. The third thing which I would like to uh, ask you is, see, whatever is in, within my skin is me. That's the general idea. Hmm? Whatever is outside my skin is you. <laughs> Whatever is in my mind is mine. My thoughts, my ideas, my emotion. Whatever is not in my mind is yours or somebody else's. But tell me, is there anything outside my awareness? There can be things outside my skin, outside my mind, but there can be nothing outside my awareness. Everything is perceived only in awareness. So then, in, in a strange way, I am united with everything. In consciousness, there are no divisions. In body and mind, all the divisions and separateness and exclusivity the special me, all this comes only with body and mind, identification with body and mind. In our real nature, it is something very different. Okay, my students uh, are very fond of selfies. <laughs> so all the time they are clicking away. So I give them this example, I tell them, okay, when you are admiring your selfie, Tell me, who's seeing what? Who's seeing what? Come on. Oh, that you have gone to the <laughs> end. The fundamentally, first, the, the mind is seeing the body. The intellect is acknowledging the mind seeing the body. And the whole process, you are aware of. Your awareness is lighting up the whole process. So you see, you are the self, not the selfie. You are the self. Anything, any way you think, you will come to this. It is, I told you, it's in the very structure of our experience. Nobody can, deb can debate against this, you know. These powers, these pointers are so powerful. Uh, I'm giving you simple Vedanta vichar, clothed in existential phenomenology. And then, um, 
you see we have the capacity to refer to ourselves quite apart from the body in your dream see recently i had a dream uh, just a few days back where i was in dakshineshwar in that nakuleshwar temple in dakshineshwar you know i don't know how many of you have been there dakshineshwar kali temple so there is a nakuleshwar shrine so in my dream i was worshiping there in that shrine now the the i there was the same it was me but my body was different i was not this pravrajika divyananda prana we have a way of referring to ourselves with the same i but in a different body it happens in dreams so you see your i sense persists but you are wearing a different body and you don't mind it you don't mind it because you are there your existence is not threatened in death existence is we are not sure of so we are frightened but in a dream and all this you see you are capable of wearing another body and the same i continue so it's fine you don't get scared in the dream so what i am trying to say is your i sense can wear whatever it wants be whatever it wants but yet you are the same i that i sense continues body and minds change am i right hmm? everybody's experience this is so you see the i sense is quite apart from body and mind you can't argue against this anyway i'm not allowing it there's no q and a <laughs> okay then who lights up your dreams see what light is that by which you dream hmm? every day you have dreams don't say no mata ji i have it rarely because you forget that you dream but you have dreams and what is that light in which you see the dream it's the light of your awareness again when you enter the state of deep sleep sushupti who feels the absence of any objective encounter absence of objects absence of everything who feels that your awareness ever is there even to report the state of deep sleep to feel the restfulness to feel the peacefulness isn't it so you your i sense it's not your i thought your i sense persists always exists it's, it's the basic feel of existence within you and it is ever present it is what is responsible for experience see what how do you feel uh, what gives you the feel of an experience now after this uh, class we are going to go into the central park at least that's the plan you will see a thousand shades of green how do you feel these thousand shades of green how do you experience them what is at the heart of experience how do you feel an experience you know those robots they don't they may know all the everything about those plants they know they don't feel they don't experience isn't it artificial intelligence that's why we need not fear it they don't experience they know a whole that chat gpt lady she, <laughs> she knows everything under the sun and above the sun and what original stuff she is bringing out my god it's it's remarkable but i am asking you does she feel did you ask her ever please do this i asked her i asked her uh, do you experience what you know you know a whole lot of things that's wonderful but do you experience what you know she said i am not programmed to experience i am only programmed to inform <laughs> <laughs> yes they don't experience because no self awareness so what gives you the feel of an experience your awareness so you see it is at the heart of everything consciousness how can we miss it how can you not bring it into normal dialogue normal understanding how can you we miss the signs of consciousness then you see there is one common denominator to all your life's experiences that's your eye sense hmm? please see when you were a baby 
and if now if i showed you a picture of yourself as a baby you wouldn't recognize it but your mother would <laughs> so that sense uh prevailed you know it 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 was there when you became a toddler the body changed completely the mind is changing rapidly then you were a teenager everything about you changed but that same i sense i never say that baby was different that toddler was different and i am now this no we don't say that the eye sense has remained the same in fact it helps us recollect some of the experiences of those years so even memory is a very very important clue or pointer to the ever present nature of your consciousness see a preceding experience a succeeding experience how do you remember that how do you remember how do you have memories because there's a common factor between the two experiences and that's your eye sense the self the reflection of the self that falls on in the mind that is why you know in the brahma sutras it is said memory points to the immutability of the cognizer who's the cognizer the supreme cognizer is the self so anything about your life will point to consciousness only we are not used to thinking in this way that's the problem i'm telling you the thought is entire you see even psychology focuses on behavioral psychology so much happens before it comes into behavior isn't it if you just focused on that aspect just just think how do i know my thoughts you will come to consciousness it's so simple we have a sense of uh, you know a composite whole even re regarding our body and our thoughts and ideas everything but actually if you see every cell in your body is functioning quite independent of you and your will does your heart take your permission to beat hmm? anybody's heart taking your permission or any organ of your body asking your permission to function well it's quite functioning quite independent of you like a machine and you end live in it from within but i know everything about the body and the mind and i know everything about this world of objects just now i know what's happening on jupiter and even beyond that beyond this galaxy in the known universe which supernova is exploding where we know it but i don't know my awareness i don't know the nature of that awareness i don't know the self see this is the big problem what is closest to us what is most obvious you know you don't uh, you don't feel it you don't realize it we i understood the importance of air only when i lived in delhi <laughs> <laughs> yes there you know in uh, at least in two months of a year you can see the air <laughs> you can smell the air you can taste the air in your mouth then it goes down it's not there throughout the year but what i'm telling you is what is most obvious and always there you don't notice it consciousness is like that it's so invested in the mind thought process you know thought pollution is so high many times you don't see consciousness you don't think about it just like how you don't see air when it's pure there is no mistaking consciousness when it's pure this is raman maharshi statement all we need to do is empty mind in a perfectly conscious state not dozing off in a perfectly conscious state if you can systematically empty mind you will discover all this for yourself there are so many such methods let me look at the time oh this time there are so many such methods which i can tell you anything will point to the same truth you have been doing drig drishya vivek here see the entire panchakosha model relies on this method drig drishya vivek huh? i am able to see the body medical science is about studying the body isn't it so obviously i am not the body i am able to see the mind psychological sciences are about study of mind that itself means i am not the mind so then what am i 
दृगदृश विवेक पंच कोश विचार अवस्था त्रय विचार सो मेनी सच एंड देर आर नंबर ऑफ विद्याज यू नो मेडिटेशन टेक्निक्स इन द उपनिषद्स मधु विद्या विद्या अक्षर विद्या शांडिल्य विद्या ऑल ऑफ देम अहम ग्रहोपासना टेक्निक्स ऑल ऑफ देम ट्राइंग टू पिन पॉइंट एंड पिन डाउन दिस आई सेंस इन यू अहम ग्रहोपासना इट सेल्फ मीन्स कैचिंग द आई अहम ग्रह उपासना द उपासना विच इज विच हेल्प्स यू टू पिन डाउन दिस आई सेंस विद इन यू ग्रैस्प द आई द अनचेंजिंग आई so these are all the methods of vedant which have come into the science of consciousness as existential phenomenology isn't it interesting <laughs> see today this is a science now that's why even in avastha tray vivek the mandukya upanishad avastha tray vivek you you are able to study the three states of everyday experience the waker see you are the waker you are the dreamer and you are the deep sleeper but you are able to study these three which itself means you are not actually them you are posing as them in those particular states see our identity you know you can build and build and build in fact for most people 50% of life goes in building identities other 50% goes in defending them <laughs> but nobody tries to explore what is identity about what is identity about who is it who is building identity so in this avastha tray vivek of mandukya upanishad you will see clearly you are able to give data about the waking state as the waker you are able to give data about the dream state as the dreamer and you are also able to give data about the deep sleep state as the pragna the deep sleeper and yet you were supposed to be in deep sleep and yet you say sukham aham aswapsam that was my experience no kinchit vedesham i slept deeply and very restfully and peacefully and i had no absolutely no objective encounter so it's an experience of absence of objects deep sleep state so who experienced who made that track record so you were there as awareness any way you argue any experience you take up anything you analyze in depth you will come to the science of consciousness it's unmistakable it's undoubtable but i told you we now we have invented a scientific method and we have to accommodate everything into the method you know that is the problem uh, many times when you try to accommodate things into converting something into a science an acceptable branch of science or philosophy you have to make adjustments vedanta vichar is a way of looking at reality as it is not looking at it through your conditioned thought world not looking at it through mind activity something more fundamental to mind that is why in yoga the usual uh, practice is you put down mind for some time so that you can do this you can do vedanta better that's the usual recommended process but if you get it just by inquiry which means you have already put down mind that's perfectly fine the 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 mind can be working and yet you can do this also if you are parangata you know you are well established in vedant then also you can do it so any way you do it but catch these important points about the science of consciousness and what will happen as a result what is the outcome of thinking like this you know in the uh, mundaka upanishad how brahma vidya is described the knowledge of brahman the self it is described as brahma vidya sarva vidya pratishtham brahma vidya is the source and support of every other branch of knowledge because it's through your consciousness that you know isn't it so if you strengthen this vidya in yourself you strengthen every other branch of science every philosophy will get strengthened you have no collision with anything because this is the open secret about the human life and existence 
so it will strengthen every because it will strengthen your mind enormously you know the moment you are able to put a distance between yourself and your thought process your vitality blooms forth you are not caught in that uh, you know you are not carried away by the thought however positive or negative whatever it may be you have now got a hold over your entire thought process your mind this is a magical state it gives you all power it brings out the power within you mind management becomes perfectly possible when you step into the self when you have self knowledge that, that is actually the secret of mind management and not just replacing thoughts and uh, emotional intelligence and all that so you see this is a very deep science it will give you charge over your life it will awaken you from within and the science of consciousness is the science of happiness and it is the science of empathy also because you know when you know consciousness bare consciousness as it is not its investiture into the thought process bare pure consciousness when you know it as it is you understand the source of bliss the source of happiness they they go together existence is happiness is consciousness and you will find the same in that's the true nature of everyone actually so it is the signs of empathy you know how will i look upon you then if i know my own nature as the self as pure consciousness i will see you as me in another form that will be my perception you are me in another form then how will we treat each other how will we look upon each other then will i have to have a moral ethical format for our dealings and <laughs> not at all you are me in another form that's the fact this is how i will see it so that is why i said the science of consciousness is the science of empathy and ethics it's the rationale behind our humanism and ethics and most of all it will tell you what human evolution means the evolutionary theory will get a, a you know it will change in many ways because the fulfillment of human life comes with the unfolding of higher consciousness survival of the fittest natural selection is fine at one particular plane in for animal life it's fine in the human life it is about the unfoldment of higher awareness that we will call evolution it will be about touching the highest reaches of human intelligence human consciousness that we will call real evolution and this will be made possible by the science of consciousness not just that you will understand the relationship between vital energies and consciousness see in in yoga vital energy is expressed they they see it like this thought emotion all that the content of your mind is nothing but an expression of vital energy this how this is what prana means vital energy means now thakur always used to say you remember shri ramakrishna always used to say brahma shakti abhed they are one and the same brahman and shakti so shakti is the vitality within you if you apply this equation subjectively your vital energy is nothing but that shakti and brahman is nothing but consciousness so there is a direct relationship between vital energy and consciousness do you know this this is what sadhana is about when you are vitally alive you are intensely aware check and see if this is true check it right now when you are vitally alive you will become intensely aware so how to increase vitality in the system that is what that is why sadhana commit energies have good thoughts meditate it's an increase of vital energy when it is fully alive you will become intensely aware fully aware that is the relationship between brahma and shakti you have to understand it subjectively you can only understand it subjectively so you see the science of consciousness will unravel very important facts about human existence 
it will help you manage your mind it will help you manage your emotional intelligence it will help you handle everything in your life because everything is a product of your thought process check this out and see everything you see here even by way of objects was a thought in somebody's mind which became so intense it was created your thought memory imagination feeling emotion everything can be handled very well and very positively when you step out of the mind with self knowledge with the knowledge of the self and this hazy understanding or demarcation between life and non life this will also go see today we are scared the robots will take up our jobs artificial intelligence will come big way and take away our jobs this is because of our hazy understanding of what life and non life means because we are not bringing awareness into common dialogue isn't it hmm? the robot is fundamentally non aware he will cannot rule aware over awareness the power of your personality lies in your consciousness nobody can rule over you so this understanding between uh, some of the most important aspects of our existence will come with the science of consciousness finally i would you know in my own humble way i ask forgiveness for uh, converting trying to convert a brahma vidya into a science because you know uh, we are trying to reach the unreachable and uh, trying to <laughs> feel or uh, talk think about the unthinkable it actually cannot be brought into words यह तो वाचो निवर्तंते अप्राप्य मन सा ठाकुर यूज टू से ब्रह्म एकमात्र उच्छिष्ट है नहीं इट हज नॉट बीन डिफाइल्ड बाय स्पीच और बाय द टंग बट वी आर ट्राइंग टू कन्वर्ट इट इनटू अ साइंस ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस लेट अस आस्क दैट फॉरगिवनेस फ्रॉम द ऑल माइटी बट फॉर अ रैशनल जनरेशन विच इज सो कंडीशन इन साइंटिफिक थाट इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू फाइंड अ रैशनल साइंटिफिक पाथ टू ट्रूथ दैट इज वाई द साइंस ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस so this is the uh, what i what wanted to present in here today uh, i want your support for the science of consciousness <laughs> in what way the the this is a veritable citadel of advait vedant this center so if you can translate these ideas bring these ideas to bear upon our understanding in different branches of science that will be a huge support to the science of consciousness what i mean to say is many of you are doctors physicians engineers you can bring uh, the understanding of consciousness into your own uh, realms of thought and function so that this becomes a common way of understanding and knowing even if you bring it into your speech this will establish consciousness as a science it can be studied scientifically it can be brought into the scientific field it satisfies the scientific method and so for rational minds this will be a very appealing path towards the ultimate fulfillment of human life that is the whole purpose in doing this and today it has come into universities you know there are many universities who are putting up departments on consciousness studies where they are studying uh, consciousness as a science with existential phenomenology which is vedanta vichar they have put up departments they are called indian knowledge system departments Uh, nrc which itself is a department like that and many other universities have approached me for this i am the syllabus creator there you know i give them ideas from the scriptures create the syllabus for them and i also teach so uh, this is coming big way let us give you know vedanta will come in different ways into people's lives this is one prominent way it is coming today and i invoke the blessings of the holy trio thakur ma and swami ji that they make our learning fruitful they make uh, their uh, bhav it it comes into our lives we are able to translate it into something which we can do in on an everyday basis and the science of consciousness flourishes in all scientific circles with this prayer i end my talk thank you very much